good morning. Good morning, everyone, and thank you. Thank you for being here. January seems to be a, a month uh, that is difficult to recruit external speakers, so you have been <laughs> stuck with some uh, internal speakers for the month. Uh, today, I want to share with you my 30-year clinical research experience in endometrial cancer. I want to tell you a story, but it is just one story. And I'm sure that every one of us can tell their own story in the areas of your expertise to show how clinical research is one of many ways where we pathologists can bring value to the system and can make real contribution to science. I have nothing to disclose. And today, uh, I am hoping to define the role of pathologists in the management of endometrial cancer. I will explain the need for continuing evolution of our role. And I will aim to recognize the enhancement of cancer diagnostics that were introduced in the past decades. I will start by reviewing the endometrial cancer management algorithms and the, the need for high information yield from the endometrial sample. Then I will go into how endometrial cancer cell type and tumor grade became the mainstay of management decision making. And that initiated the call on pathologists to fine tune our diagnostic criteria. But we didn't stop there. And we continued to add candidates for further exploration for better patient care. Okay. So the story started back in uh, 1985, 86, when the gynecologic oncology group started their study known as GOG 33, that was published in cancer in 1987. This was a landmark publication because in this study, they concluded that all patients, all patients with endometrial cancer need to have to be staged by formal lymphadenectomy, starting with pelvic lymphadenectomy and even paraaortic lymphadenectomy. Almost immediately after this, the International Federation of Gynecologic Oncology reversed staging of endometrial cancer to include lymph, lymph node status in the uh, stage. This was a huge deal back then. It's a, it's a big deal because they introduced a process, a procedure of lymphadenectomy, which prolongs the operative time, increases risk for intraoperative complications, and the patients will have to live with the consequences of lower leg edema in many cases as a result of the lymphadenectomy. This was a big deal. Of course, the political side of that decision was that lymphadenectomy typically is performed by gynecologists who have formal training in gynecologic oncology, and these typically practice in academic setting. So basically, they are shifting management of all endometrial cancer from the community to academic uh, centers. Of course, over years now, we see many gynecologic oncologists practicing in community hospitals like uh, uh, Abbott Northworth, North, uh, Northwest uh, Hospital. But the bottom line is that formal staging and lymphadenectomy is performed by gynecologic oncology. Since that day, the debate started, a big violent debate on do we really need to do this or are we going to be able to select a subset of low risk patients who really don't need lymphadenectomy? And that debate started back then, more than 20, more than 30 years ago, and it is still going on today. And as I will show you, all the algorithms and systems that were designed to select those low-risk patients depend on tumor type and tumor grade, which are determined by pathologists. And no wonder, all of a sudden, we found ourselves right in the center of that debate, because we always held the key 
for arguments on both sides, which I'm going to go over them. So let us start by a case from every day's practice. Let us say this is a 57 year old with a postmenopausal bleeding, saw her gynecologist who ordered a pelvic sonography, thickened endometrial stripe, endometrial biopsy is projected. You can see complex glands, back to back, nuclear atypia, round nuclei, mitotic figures, and all pathologists in the room would recognize this as endometrial biopsy, representing endometrial adenocarcinoma of the endometrioid type, FIGO grade one. So in the bottom line diagnosis, the pathologist is trained to give these two parameters, cell type and tumor grade, because everything is going to uh, uh, be based on these two pieces of information. So the preoperative workup of patients as we do it today, if the diagnosis was endometrioid FIGO 1 or 2, all we need is pelvic sonography. If the diagnosis is anything higher than that, FIGO 3 or serous or clear cell or carcinoma, sarcoma, patients are referred for CT to chest, abdomen and pelvis. So the preoperative workup is based on, the, on this uh, two pieces of information. This, our patient here had already pelvic sonography. So let's go ahead and take her to the OR. The patient, the surgeon performed the hysterectomy, sent the uh, uterus to the pathologist, and the pathologist looked at it, opened it and looked at it, and gave three pieces of information. The pathologist confirmed the cell type, confirmed the tumor grade, but also gave a measurement. In this case, it was uh, 3.2 centimeters and also had to comment on the depth of myometrial invasion. How far did the tumor go into the myometrium? So the frozen section, we are trained to give three pieces of information, tumor size, tumor grade, and the depth of myometrial invasion. In this case, the tumor size, the cutoff is two centimeters. This is past the cutoff and the depth of invasion is beyond the half. So it passed that cutoff. And therefore the next step is the surgeon is going to proceed to the lymphadenectomy. What I just discussed now is known as Mayo criteria. Mayo criteria is, uh, and the algorithm is shown here. And as you can see in this publication more than 20 years ago, uh, Dr. Keeney, the gynae pathologist, and the lead author on that paper is Dr. Mariani, gynecologic oncologist from Mayo, decided that there is a subset of patients. This thing is not working. Right? There's a subset of patients of FIGO1 with tumor less than two centimeters, depth of invasion less than half, and these guys don't need the lymphadenectomy. Anyone else here would need a lymphadenectomy. If the biopsy was called serous or clear cell, they wouldn't do, even do the frozen section. And if it was FIGO 1 or 2 and the frozen section, as this case showed invasion into the outer half, the patient will have lymphadenectomy. This is the Mayo criteria and it is followed all over the country and maybe in some other parts of the world. Back in Canada, we didn't follow it <laughs> for <laughs> obvious reasons that I could show now, but we heard about it. And then I landed here in 2014 and everybody was uptight about it. And I talked to my colleague, uh, Dr. Klein in the back, uh, what is going on? Are we doing this? And she said, yeah, we are. I said, I don't think so. My colleagues are actually not doing it. And we, we decided to study this. We decided to study all hysterectomies in our archives from 2002 up to that point. We landed with 800 cases that had a frozen section diagnosis. And we audited how pathologists in this department, academic center, these were renowned pathologists, not necessarily gynecologic pathologists, but they are practicing experienced pathologists. Are they actually giving these three pieces of information in frozen section or not? And the shock was, which kind of I could predict it, that about half of these patients, the pathologist didn't even give the um, tumor grade on frozen section. Everything was fine. The gynecologists were fine. The patients were fine. Everybody was fine. 
but the pathologists were not really following Mayo criteria. And what does that show us? It showed us that when we have a complicated clinical algorithm that depends on pathologist uh, articulation of certain pieces of information, we need more than human memory to remember to give those information. We need IT, we need some, uh, some solution that will make a hard stop on the diagnosis before the pathologist proceeds. So, today... Can I ask a question on that, on that last day? Is that just a UMMC or is it the whole... No, 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 this is UMMC. Just, this is just us. UMMC. High-risk patients today, according to many criteria, as I said, are defined by FIGO 1 or 2 with invasion more than 50% or tumor more than 2 centimeters or any FIGO 3 or non-endometrioid cancer. This is, FIGO, this is Mayo criteria. Many centers, including ours, moved away from uh, Mayo criteria. Now we are following what is known as GOG 99 uh, criteria. GFG99 is basically the same because it depends on the two pieces of information, but it added the age of the patient. So patients are stratified, their risk is stratified according to their age. Back in Canada, we were sitting on a gold mine because we said, hey, how is this actually working? Because here in Canada, it was the opposite. We wanted to push guide, uh, uh, endometrial cancer, especially low-risk endometrial cancer, to the community to be performed by a regular gynecologist without lymphadenectomy. Lymphadenectomy was not part of the staging, so it was in Canada and most Europe. Most European countries do not subscribe to, to that uh, study. So we decided to, make a, to go, to go a, a, through a comparison. We looked at 222 uh, uh, hysterectomies from uh, Ontario and compared that with Duke where Mayo criteria were, was followed very, very strictly. This was a very well-designed study. It was very well controlled. There was central review of tumor stage and cell type. Patients were matched. And the bottom line is that lymphadenectomy was performed in about half of these patients and about 90% of these surgeries were done by gynecologic oncologists in the university uh, uh, center, where in Ontario, only about 10% of cases had lymphadenectomy, and about 60, only 60% 60 were performed by gyneoncologists, and the majority, the other were, were performed by regular gynecologists in the community. And look at the survival curve and the recurrence-free survival. No difference. No difference. And that was the argument, and that is still the European argument as why patients really don't need lymphadenectomy. The good news is that today, here, we moved even beyond GOG 99 because most patients, low risk patients, are getting sentinel lymph node resection. Hey, we have done sentinel lymph node for vulva, we have done it for cervix, and it was working very well. Why not do it for endometrium? Uh, it, there is a learning curve for the operator and gynecologists and gynecologic oncologists have to learn the technique and they learned it over the last 15 years. And all the studies on the topic shows that results are almost as accurate as uh, 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 complete formal dissection of the lymph nodes. So as you know, for injecting the dye, the surgeon needs the uterus in the patient, so they don't send it for frozen section anymore. So we don't, most of the low risk patients today, we don't do, uh, we don't do frozen section on them. So we saw how tumor type and, and, and grade affected the preoperative workup. We saw how it affected the operative management. How does it affect postoperative uh, adjuvant therapy? It does too. So, if the tumor in early stage patients, endometrioid, FIGO 1 or 2, what, whatever criteria you follow, these patients are likely to have uh, brachytherapy or pelvic radiation. On the other hand, if it is serous tumor or high grade endometrioid, these patients get chemotherapy. So, still, tumor type and grade affect post, uh, post surgery uh, uh, adjuvant therapy. In advanced stages, it doesn't matter because all patients are going to get chemo and radiation. 
Let us forget about this for a second. I will come to, to that later in my talk. So the well, all what we ask pathologists today is to diagnose cancer, for God's sake, give us a cell type and give us a grade. How easy is that? That actually is not easy at all. It is extremely problematic. Why? Because actually we don't have or we didn't have clear criteria to articulate and to communicate amongst ourselves. And we still debate about many of these issues. And I will talk to you about how there was a call on pathologists over the years to fine tune our criteria for God's sake, stop confusing us. And the reality is even when we get it right, it is not enough. I have always been an advocate that endometrial samples definitely can give us more information. We need more information than just the cell type and the tumor grade. So here is the fine tuning part. We need to fine tune our criteria. So these are the only clinically actionable pieces of information in the report endometroid or non-endometroid, and the tumor grade if it is endometrial. Other things that we see on the slide are nice and they are very interesting, but they are not clinically actionable. So, and, and this is, and I, I, I can tell you that all of us in the room here, we sit somewhere along that spectrum. From one end, we have pathologists in the view of, I have to convey everything I see on the slide. I am a pathologist and I make observations on the slide and I have to document them and I have to convey them to the clinician. So that's one extreme end of the spectrum. On the other extreme end, when we have minimalists who are pragmatic and want to only provide the information that are clinically actionable, so it sticks in the mind of the surgeon who's very busy uh, so we don't confuse them. How much of information, how much information are we going to give that is very personal in our practice? But you talk to all gynecologists, they tell you, guys, squamous differentiation, mucinous differentiation, papillary configuration. All of that stuff is interesting for you, but it doesn't do anything for me. <laughs> so let us talk about first serous carcinoma. We all agree that this is serous carcinoma, high nuclear grade, solid sheets, Detached cell clusters, which is very characteristic in serous carcinoma, prominent nuclei, mitotic figures. Serous carcinoma is very well defined. We started to recognize that they come in very in so many flavors. They could be glandular, they could be papillary, they could be solid, they could be microcystic. So there are so many uh, patterns. The first pattern, as a matter of fact, that was described back in 1982 was just limited to the surface. And they thought that was serous carcinoma. Today, we, con we diagnose this as uh, EIC. So that is, we continue to recognize more patterns and fine tune our criteria. So what are we going to do with this? What are we going to do when part of the tumor looks endometrioid and part of the tumor looks serous? And then they started introducing the concept of mixed tumor, uh, mixed cell type. Well, what is mixed? When can we call it mixed? At, at first, anything you see, that you can call it mixed. Then we went into an era where we said it has to be 10%. Today, w, uh, WHO requires 5%. And the reality is, any serous carcinoma in the tumor, about 20 or 25%, the tumor is going to be serous carcinoma. And that is where we, we sat with gynecologists and told them, guys, this is very difficult. We, we tell you in the diagnosis that it is mixed, and then you don't treat it as serous. They said, yeah, but you didn't say serous. I said, I didn't say serous because it didn't have the 10%. They said, no, if you want me to, to treat it as serious, just say serious. I said, okay. So we told them, anytime you see any serous tumor on the slide, I will call it serious. Okay, just, we can deal with that. So that is the, the communication and the fine tuning when to call it serious and when not to call it serious. And then people started to run into this kind of tumor where it is just high grade, but is it really serious or not? And this is very good paper by three pillars of gyne oncology, Dr. Jilk from British Columbia, uh, 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 
Mass General and uh, Sloan Kettering, top top notch gynecologist, came up with the panel of immunostains that you see that can tell you that it, it is serous or not serous. P53, P16, ER, and PR. Serous carcinoma should be strongly and diffusely positive for P53 and P16, should be ER, PR, weak or negative. In their panel, they also suggested P10. Is that simple? That is simple. No, it is not simple. <laughs> because pathologists on the East Coast, they say, you know what? If the tumor is not P53 positive, it's not P16 positive, don't call it serous. And I say, well, if the tumor looks like serous, I'm going to call it serous. I don't care about the immune state. The flip side of that argument, we have pathologists, and Molly here uh, shares the pain with me. If they do P16 and, and P53 on a tumor and it is positive, it is serious. No, it isn't, because some endometrioid could also be P16 and P53 positive. So all of that is, is, is uh, we need to do better. We need to continue to do better in the way we diagnose these tumors. Clear cell carcinoma is another mess because clear cell carcinoma comes in so many flavors, high nuclear grade, hyaline globules, clear cytoplasm. But this is a very nice uh, paper from uh, University of California. They did a survey of clear cell carcinomas and realized that pathologists really are all over the map when it comes to clear cell carcinoma. They said, okay, wait a minute. You can use HNF1 beta, and it helps you with that. An antibody that we failed to get it done in Fairview for five years, we still don't have it. We hope we get it one day. We have Napsin A, it helps, but it is not as reliable as uh, HNF1 uh, beta. So there are ways to fine tune our criteria. What about tumor grade? Instead of calling them one, two, three, there is trend to, uh, there is a trend now to lump them into a two-tier system, high grade and low grade. As you know, when pathologists have one, two, three, they disagree. If you give them only two options, probably they will agree better. So that's one way of doing it. There are two ways of doing the high grade versus low grade. And that that system was proposed a long, uh, many, many years ago, but it never picked up in this country. The reason it didn't pick up because it doesn't tie in with the Mayo criteria or GOG 99. What is the gynecologist going to do if I tell them that this is a low grade tumor? What does that mean to them? Give me a FIGO grade and give me a tumor cell type. So how are we doing? How are we doing with tumor type and cell grade? We, we decided to study uh, our, our, our agreement and we studied 105 consecutive cancer samples. We were able to correlate them with hysterectomies only in 85 cases. We gave the slides to six very well-trained gynecologic pathologists. That's all what they do. They breathe, they eat, they drink gyne pathologists all their life and that's what they do. And they were supposed to be top-notch. And we also asked them, can you just say it's a high-grade tumor based on nuclear grade, cell morphology, anything. Just give, give us something. And you can see that they probably, all six of them, agreed on about 70% when it comes to cell type. So we are doing pretty good on cell type. But look at the three-tiered system all over the map. When we asked them to do it in a two-tier system, it was much better. And again, again, this is a, a, a testament to the fact that uh, you can see the CAPA uh, analysis. We were very good with high, the very low grade and very good with the very high grade, but we were all over the map with FIGO2. Interestingly, we did very well when we asked them, just tell us it's a high grade. And, and that's why another, this is another philosophical point. So instead of confusing everybody in the biopsy, if I, and, I, and I tell my colleagues that, can you just say it is high grade?
Because if you say it's a hybrid, and maybe you send them an email or talk to them on the phone, you say, I, I really don't know the cell type per se on the biopsy, but this patient needs staging. That's a good, that's a good message. Do lymphadenectomy on this patient. We did another study, and this, is, uh, this was funded from, uh, by a grant from uh, Tel Aviv uh, to study 650 patients, hysterectomies correlated the biopsy and the, the hysterectomy. This is how we call them on biopsy, and this is what the hysterectomy showed. How are we doing in predicting the cell type and tumor grade? And you can see the problem with this the problem with this is that you can see that 4% of patients that are called FIGO1 on biopsy are actually FIGO3 or even serous carcinoma on hysterectomy. And that is the reason why in this country we insist on staging all patients. Because the, the pathologists on the biopsy, really, if, if we have that system like in, in Canada or in Europe, if you are not going to do lymphadenectomy for low-grade patients, these patients will slip through the cracks unless you catch them on a frozen section. So unless a frozen section is part of the procedure, you are going to miss the lymphadenectomy. Can we go back and do lymphadenectomy after you finish the hysterectomy? Can you go back to do the lymphadenectomy? The, goal, the, 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 the rule of thumb, no, you can't. Because there's so much adhesions inside, you cannot. We have two renowned gynecologic oncologists from this center who actually go back. They don't mind it. Good for us, but typically they don't like to go back. So these 4% of patients would really be uh, harmed by this, uh, by not doing lymphadenectomy. The other extreme end of that, you can see that these other patients there's a good percentage of patients that pathologists overcall on biopsy and the hysterectomy really didn't, the patient really didn't need lymphadenectomy. So let us try to add more candidates to this. Let us try to bring more items to discuss and go beyond the cell type and the tumor grade. And I'm going to tell you about some candidates that we explored, uh, ex explored over the years, some morphologic, some immunohistochemical, and some molecular and genomic. Let us look at this section here. In, in this part, you can see endometrial cancer invading the myometrium, but it is so fragmented and it, I, I don't know what this is. This is so much fragmentation and, and the tissue is falling off and, we have been seeing this all along. We have seen this all the time. And we assume that this is bad processing or bad sectioning or whatever, until someone decided to study these clones and they found that these clones are actually different because they are more aggressive because they have KRAS mutation. They wanted to name this lesion. They didn't know what to name it. They called it what it is, microcystic elongated fragmented uh, pattern and, and a terrible name. Uh, <laughs> we call it MELF. MELF uh, uh, cases. We don't know what to call it, but that's that's what it is. Okay, so is that significant for for management? Yes. Look at this MELF case here, and look at these these cells. <laughs> these cells are actually invading separately. And where are they going? They are going into lymphatics. Aha, uh -huh. so now they realize that MELF patients are at higher risk for lymphatic invasion and therefore for lymph node metastasis. Okay, that's a good observation. We didn't stop there. We have Dr. Rabi here in the back and Dr. Klein. They wanted to look into this and said, well, wait a minute. While these patients are so special, our gynecologists are moving more into sentinel lymph node. And we actually do not have a protocol for processing lymph nodes. Do we cut them every two millimeters? Do we use uh, cytokeratin? We know how to do, deal with them in melanoma. We know how to deal with them with breast cancer and cervical cancer. But nobody told us how to process lymph, sentinel lymph nodes 
in endometrial cancer, especially if they have MELF type of invasion. So that's what they did. Uh, uh, th this is our University of Minnesota experience. We got sentinel lymph nodes from 15 patients with MELF. We collected all cases of MELF uh, uh, invasion from the system, from all Fairview hospitals and our hospital. We studied them. We looked at them. This is a, this is a very easily called negative lymph node. But Dr. Raby uh, uh, did cytokeratin. And sure enough, she started to see isolated tumor cells for short ITCs. More ITCs by immunohistochemistry. And it makes you stop and wonder, what's going on? Did I really miss them? Yes, you did. Because they are actually there. <laughs> you just didn't see them. So... No wonder, no wonder this study was accepted as soon as they submitted it, because it is telling people that adding immunohistochemistry to sentinel lymph nodes doubles the rate of detecting uh, lymph node metastasis. That is huge. But let's go back. Let's go back to that table where I showed how our diagnosis affects uh, 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 post-operative management. And when you ask all gynecologists, I did that, from many academic centers across the country. How do you deal with your patients when we call it MELF or ITCs for God's sake? I don't know. You know what? I don't know. You guys have a point. You brought this to our attention. You, descri you, descri you described a new entity, but we really don't know how to deal with it. It still didn't fit in our algorithm of post-operative management. And this is how we are pushing the envelope into modifying criteria to deal with our new discoveries for things such as MELF and ITCs. Carcinosarcomas. We all know how to diagnose carcinosarcomas, but then we had a, a very um, smart resident back in, in Toronto who said, well, yeah, but some of these tumors are polypoid, some of these tumors are not polypoid. Are they the same? I said, I don't know. Why don't you tell us? So she went to do a gynecology fellowship at MD Anderson and she talked to the folks down there. They said, we don't know. Let's put pieces together. So we pulled 58 patients with carcinosarcomas and categorized them into type A and type P, polypoid and non-polypoid. Guess what? Of course they are different. Polypoids are mostly sarcoma. They go nowhere. They don't invade the myometrium. They don't metastasize to lymph node. And patients actually do very well. The p-value stopped short of significance, but that doesn't stop us because we know that carcinosarcomas makes a big difference if it is polypoid or non-polypoid. And we are encouraged now, after this publication, to add this to our report at the bottom: the tumor is polypoid, mostly sarcomatous, no myometrial invasion, and may talk about. Uh, the differences and these patients do typically do very well and we cite this particular paper. So is that mostly sarcomatoid or what you say yes. is it mostly or uh, Mo uniformly uniformly sarcomatoid because the definition of as well sarcoma means you need to see some carcinoma here. Yes, yes. There is carcinoma. Yeah. But it is typically endometrioid yeah. and it doesn't metastasize. Because if we talk to any guy in the they tell you guys, guys, again, carcinosarcomas, it, it turns you on and you are very happy about carcinosarcomas. But what drives the biology of carcinosarcoma is the epithelial component. So when, you, when I read your report, I want to read what cell type is in the carcinosarcoma. As soon as they read serous, then it becomes a serous carcinoma. Here, as soon as they read endometrioid, then it makes sense. It's endometrioid. It is no great. It is not quite metastasis. We had a very enthusiastic uh, pathologist back in Toronto who, uh, who was very disturbed by necrosis that we see on the slide. He also asked the question, what is, why do we see so much necrosis in some cases, but not all cases? So we decided to study necrosis in about 200 cases. And we graded necrosis in a very arbitrary uh, one, two, three uh, plus system. And sure enough, we found that the more necrosis you find on the endometrial biopsy, the more likelihood you are going to have deep myometrial invasion, cervical involvement, 
or a lymphovascular invasion in your hysterectomy. How about that? So necrosis is a marker for high-risk uh, histology in the subsequent hysterectomy. We run into these cases quite often, maybe one every month or two months, where the histology is really ambiguous and the pathologist looks at this, you can say this is cancer, but I really don't know, is it endometrial or endocervical? Yes, there are some clues to tell you that it is endocervical, but sometimes tumors don't read the book and we don't know what it is. And guess what? Yes, there is a method to help with this. We can do HPV testing. HPV testing is not really going to answer that question, but at least it will answer the question whether the process is HPV driven or not. So, and I mentioned this because I had to copy a piece, a segment from an email I received from a friend of mine, a gynecological oncologist, and she was saying, guys, guys, nothing irritates me more than a pathologist who says endometrial cancer, sorry, who says adenocarcinoma, and comes back to say, I don't know if it is endometrial or endocervical. Why are you doing this to me? The workup is different. Surgery is different. New adjuvant could be different. Everything is different. These are two different diseases. Can you do something better to help me with this issue? Is it endocervical or endometrial? And, I, and the answer, I think, in my mind, is obviously in the clinical history, prior HPV, age of patient, all of that, plus if we can do uh, a molecular testing for HPV. MMR uh, IHC testing. Yes, we know that we use that for Lynch syndrome screening, but there is more value to that. And the value is in the selected patients who want to uh, preserve their fertility and to preserve their ovaries. When the, when the tumor is um, MMR deficient, that patient becomes ill ineligible for that uh, procedure because 10% of Lynch syndrome patients are going to develop ovarian cancer. These are young patients and they have been proven by screening and by genetic counseling that she has Lynch syndrome. They tell her you cannot preserve your ovaries. L1 cell adhesion molecule, the champion for this is Dr. Uh, Boris Winterhoff here, one of our gynae oncologists partnered with uh, Molly and, and other members of our department to study this molecule, L1, L1 CAM, is a transmembrane protein that was first described in neural cells. It has been shown by IHC in some endometrial cancers. It drives high, ag highly aggressive tumors. They, uh, it, it, it inversely uh, related to E. cadherin and ER and PR uh, expression and it is believed to promote aggressive tumor behavior because of proliferation, migration, and ability to metastasize. So this, this has been described almost a decade ago, and this is the largest European multi-center study where they demonstrated that 18% of cases have L1 CAM expression on IHC, and we don't want to get into why these patients have aggressive tumor. Is it because we here in this center at least believe that L1 CAM marks a hidden component of serous carcinoma that our eyes do not recognize on H and E, but when you do the stain, they light up. Maybe it is not serous, maybe it is neuroendocrine carcinoma. We really don't know that very well, but we do know but we do know that patients with L1 CAM uh, positive tumors do a lot worse than uh, L1 CAM negative uh, tumors. We are trying to implement this antibody in our panel here. Again, it's not working. We just could not bring L1 CAM to our panel. Alina does it for some reason, but we could not do L1 CAM uh, for our patients. On the research side, Moana, uh, uh, Yuana, Yuana and uh, Molly 
watching too many kids' movies. Uh, <laughs> Joanna and Molly uh, studied this with uh, Dr. Winterhoff, accumulated a cohort, a nice cohort of 135 uh, endometrioid adenocarcinoma. What they did is they applied age score to reporting them to add more structure around them. And they decided that anything 10 or more is going to be positive. Anything less than 10 is going to be uh, negative. And of course, uh, their study showed that L1 CAM positive tumors are, have a higher rate of recurrence than L1 uh, CAM negative tumors. A solid paper. This rate here, this is 22%. 22% of our cases were positive, where in fact the international study showed only 18%. I think, I think that 22% is because adding the H score, H score gave a better standardized way of reporting them. Uh, but anyways, it, it hovers ar uh, around 15 to 20%. Uh, so again, um, we, we can't wait to have this as part of our diagnostics in this lab for endometrial cancer. We do L1 CAM and we can report it uh, as clinically relevant to the patient. Many, many years ago, back in Oklahoma, a time when they just recognized the role of HER2 new in breast cancer, and they discovered Herceptin. Herceptin was not FDA approved at the time for breast cancer, but they were experimenting with Herceptin. And someone asked me, have you tested her to new in endometrial cancer? We did that at the time literature search. Nobody looked into it. And we decided, let us look at it. Let's look into her to new in endometrial cancer. And we found that about half of patients with serous carcinoma or non-endometrioid carcinoma have her to new uh, overexpression. We were the first ever to report this observation. This observation before that was not known at all. And we were the first team to recognize that 50% of non-endometrioid adenocarcinoma ha have overexpression of her to new. You can see where that's going because in our paper, we made, this is an actual quote from the paper that the altered expression of these growth factors could serve as guide for prognosis and for treatment of these patients. So that was like 30 years ago. Herceptin was uh, approved by FDA in 1998. So it's four years after that paper and it was for breast cancer only. So since that time, if you, if you do a literature search today, you will find more than 300 papers from across the world studying her to new in endometrial cancer and serous carcinoma. And the most significant of which is this paper, which is the randomized phase two trial, which established the role of Herceptin in her to new. Patients with serous carcinoma, her to new positive serous carcinoma. Patients with serous carcinomas are desperate. They have an aggressive disease we want to give them as many options as we can. And without this observation, gyne gyne oncologists had nothing to offer to patients with serous carcinoma. Today, it's not a reflex test yet. We are working on that. Uh, yesterday, I, uh, last night, I had a case of serous carcinoma and I sent an email to the gynecologist. I said, do you want me to do her to you? She said, no. She is 92 and we are not going to do anything with her. But I think where we are today is that we are in a phase where we do it case by case basis, but hopefully we will get her to new to be a, a, a reflex testing for serous carcinoma. Let us take that one step further. And this is what's happening now. Dr. Klein and Dr. Erickson from Gyne Oncologist partnered with one of our former residents, Mariam Shahi, who is doing uh, Gyne Oncology, the Gyne Pathology Fellowship at uh, Hopkins, and we combined cases. We got 64 cases from here, and she collected 50 cases from uh, Johns Hopkins. And now we are asking the question of can her to predict recurrence in early stage? Remember that the Herceptin proved, well, proved effective in only advanced disease, 
Now we want to see if it can help us with early stage cancer to predict recurrence and survival. And the study is ongoing. I know they are looking at the slides and they are reviewing the charts and uh, the statistical analysis will be performed. The discussion cannot be complete without going over the cancer genomic atlas classification of endometrial cancer. And that aimed at um, designing post-surgical adjuvant therapy for these patients. And when you put endometrial cancer in one of these four boxes, uh, polymutated, these are the cases, the low-grade endometrioid carcinoma that probably do not need any adjuvant therapy. And you go down the list and you see some familiar uh, uh, <laughs> candidates here for uh, PDL1 uh, treatment or again, her to new and her septin in uh, serous carcinoma. This is not mainstream yet. We don't do this on every case. It is expensive. It's prohibitive. And I think uh, Andy can educate us more about uh, the technical aspect because according to the literature, this can only be performed on uh, fresh tissue. Yesterday, he reminded me, he's shaking his head. The guy is a wizard. He did it on paraffin here. And this is what uh, Andy is doing with uh, Dr. Uh, Winterhop. They are doing this uh, comprehensive genomic profiling and looking at the same cohort uh, of patients that Molly has studied with for L1 CAM. And they, are, they selected these uh, 48 patients and they are looking at any of these features uh, uh, in them. It's just a proof of principle but correlating uh, L1 uh, CAM expression with uh, genomic uh, profiling. So in closing, I just want to say that I have always been very impressed, very impressed and very intrigued by this closed feedback loop of how our role evolves over the years. Over the past three decades, endometrial cancer management evolved through maintaining the positive feedback loop between pathologists and oncologists. And we see this in every system, in breast, in lung, in every system, in lymphomas, where there is a clinical question. In this case, the clinical question was risk stratification. And then that translates to a call upon pathologists. Can you please fine tune your criteria and make it relevant and clinically actionable as you can? Pathologists are very good at doing that, but they don't stop at doing that. They add their thing. They take it up a notch from just fine tuning to discovery. And through translational research, we can translate a lot of our discoveries as I hope, hopefully I could, I could show you today into adding new biomarkers that ultimately <clears throat> will lead to where we want to go, which is improved patient care. At the end, this is, the, this is my journey. This is 30 years worth of clinical research. And I have to acknowledge uh, great, great mentors, Dr. KW, Dr. Min from Oklahoma, a great gynecopathologist who taught me a lot of what I know today. He retired since then. Rob Manuel and John Walker are great gynae oncologists. They are still active today, active pillars of the GOG, and um, they, they still uh, publish. We did a lot of work with them in uh, vulvar cancer as well. At the University of Toronto, we were very fortunate to recruit uh, Dr. Nofok Moses uh, from uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, she is dynamite. She has limitless energy for research always has ideas and pursues them. Al Covens and Ida Ackerman from Gynae Oncologist, great mentors. They taught me a lot through Tumor Board and the interaction when they say things like, Khalifa, you, you don't make any sense. What you are saying doesn't, doesn't translate to anything meaningful in my head. Tell me something that helps me in the OR. They were the ones who installed this in me. Uh, great pathologist, Dr. Dubey from uh, Quebec City. And Dr. Ishmael was my fellow now. She is the chief of pathology in Sunnybrook. At the University of Minnesota, of course, big names, Dr. Klein, Dr. Raby, uh, Ericsson and Winterhoff are our partner in, in uh, what we do. 
And of course, Joanna is in the University of Rochester, and she was the champion behind our N1N study. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any discussion? Your story about uh, necrosis, I'm mean, just thinking about that. Could the necrosis that you found be a surrogate marker for size of tumor? Because the bigger the tumor, the more aggressive, and then more likely it is to be necrosis. So, did you correlate the necrosis with the size of the tumor? Do you find that to be standard dependent? Yes. So, well, th this was a multivariate analysis. Uh, uh, and it was it was statistically significant, but you are absolutely right. It is a surrogate for tumor size. It's a surrogate for whether, whether it is qualified or not. It's a surrogate for high grade. But the idea here is that when we see the crosses on the slide, just don't take it lightly. Just take. I, I had a case last week where it looked like endometrial cancer, but it was full of necrosis, and it had me stop a little bit. And when I looked, when I got beyond the 10x uh, uh, tower. I started to see serous carcinoma. So it turned out to be serous carcinoma. So the message we, we say today to residents and everybody, when you see necrosis in endometrial biopsy, don't take it lightly, just stop and think of it. So in this, another uh, uh, necrosis question. So yeah. do you see any evidence of the uh, you know, immune system involvement in any of these necrotic areas? Because that, that could cause necrosis also. Yeah. Or is it, is it pretty much absent? I, 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 I wouldn't know. I don't know. Immune response to endometrial cancer, Molly can uh, answer if I'm, if I'm mistaken, but I don't, I'm not aware of the immune system being explored. Uh, it hasn't. It's an opportunity. It's only for uh, distant, uh, distant when they're trying to target something much effort. It's not the test we do for diagnosis. I think on Leo's comment too, and the other thing that I've thought about when I've looked at these slides at the L1 cam, the reason why I think the H score is a good way to score that marker is it's not your typical biomarker that a pathologist is used to looking at where it's either kind of positive in most cells or negative in most cells. It's very heterogeneous. It's on off, it's binary. You have single cells. I bet you if you studied a bunch of those melts, you'd see a bunch of melt cells that are down low that have L1 cam. My guess is because it's an adhesion marker molecule, it's probably interacting with macrophages and other things at those sites where it isn't trapezating into the yeah. and other things like that. Is, you know, Kaylee's not here, I don't think, but I mean, there's, there's probably a role for certain associated macrophages, other components in the immune system that are interacting with those specific cell populations. Right. That, 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 that's the bad actor. I mean, that's that's why we got to understand what drives metastasis in the first place. I, mean, right. I think that's a huge window of opportunity that's not well explored. I, I mean, even just correlating macrophage markers, polarization markers of macrophages with L1 can expression, uh, I think could be something interesting and reasonably straightforward to keep on here. We're running out of those tissues on this block. We might need a new core. Talk to Bobby about that. <laughs> more to John? Yeah, more. We get more cases. So. Uh, when you're following the Mayo Clinic algorithm, or the Mayo algorithm, and looking for the depth of myometrial invasion, how do you choose your <laughs> sections? Yes. <laughs> we have some of the greatest PAs sitting in the back, and it's up to them. They, well, it's, it, they keep making the senior sections, okay. and visually, we just need to identify the area of the deepest invasion. Okay. Okay. Again, this is, this is science. <laughs> this is science. <laughs> it's, it's, it couldn't be further from science. <laughs> Do you have a cohort of uh, 501 uh, endometrial uh, adenal no recurrence for 10 to 15 years and the perceptual one? I at least have 10 15 cases in diagnosis. I, I call that uh, diagnosis and then facing question. This is 10 15 years after the diagnosis, there's no recurrence. So, why do you call it a metastatic endometrial carcinoma? Actually, it is. So, I don't know how it happens, but it is. Yes. Going back to the 
previous bias, the original bias, and they exploited it with this things like Ed Mark Tam or people that they thought were um, back then we didn't do even seven So yeah, we had one that metastasized the syndrome. Yeah, and that was the same one. Yeah, so I think that's the same thing. Yeah, 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 Sorry for the outcome. The isolated tumor cells, when they are found in the leaf nodes in the patients from here, from MRC, do you have any things of that or anything to look at the prognosis? Or I can see it. There was an abstract, uh, there was an abstract in last year's uh, US CAP. They were validated because remember, uh, dividing metastasis to lymph node into from macro and micro is a new concept in the in uh, kind of pathology. Uh, and there was an abstract looking into that, and they said yes, micro and macro correlates with clinical uh, recurrence, but ITCs did not. So as as far as we are concerned, as of today, they really don't know what to do with ITCs. It is not a marker for recurrence. We, we think that we cannot ignore them, we have to report them. And as I showed in that table when I asked my colleagues here, they say we just treat them like, like the other low-grade endometrial cancer and until, until we discover something else. But probably eventually we are going to discover something else. So what do you think about imaging and staging? I think that now the imaging techniques, there's so much improvement in it. Why don't if you call high grade uh, or low grade for your diagnosis? Why don't you uh, image state it first uh, rather than a further section? Still, lymphadenectomy is part of the management in this country. They wouldn't stage by imaging. I, I don't think anyone will uh, agree to that. Is it is it in lung? Do they stage? Uh, in the head and neck. And when they were diagnosed with cancer, automatically MRI and and, and CAT scan. Yeah, is it reliable? It, it is, I think, one of the, I think, I think yeah. it is. Yeah. But, but the neck, the, 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 the lymphoma dissection is not for staging, it is also for therapeutic. So, Question, they have for, uh, if you have a low-grade endometrioid um, biopsy or heritage, there are certainly clinicians who advocate use of MRI preoperatively to help a guide uh, their staging intraoperatively, and that is kind of in conjunction with or in repla replacing the intraoperative frozen section. Yeah, but the decision to to do lymphadenectomy or not would still be based on. on the yeah, it just the, it, there. I think if if there's any imaging that's being used for that um, indication, it's in the tumors that are presumed to be FIGO one endometrioid. And they're using MRI, and it's still, it's not the standard practice, but that is probably the best chance of that being useful. I, the um, as far as lymph node metastases, I don't think that there that there are any really good modalities. I mean, they've used that for decades for cervical cancer, right? That wasn't really predictive, so I don't think it's very predictive for endometrial cancer. Thank you. Thank you.